Hello everyone, welcome back to CRIM 2080 Introduction to Forensic Science. So this is our second video for the bloodstain pattern analysis lecture. In our last one, we talked about the different types of information that we can obtain by analyzing bloodstain patterns. In this one, we're gonna go through and talk about the various different types of bloodstains that we uh, encounter at a crime scene. So with that, I'm gonna share the screen and we can get started. So just as a forewarning, some of these slides are going to have graphic images that are meant to illustrate the different types of blood stain patterns that we commonly see at a crime scene. So just be warned. So here we are, we have, uh, we're going to talk about three different types of blood stains. So we have spatter patterns, transfer patterns, and passive blood stains. So starting off with spatter, these are the ones that uh, we focus on in our last lecture. So all that information, the angle of impact, the directionality, uh, area of origin, those things are probably going to be coming from this type of blood stain pattern, uh, a blood spatter. So there are going to be four main types that we're going to talk about impact spatter, cast off spatter, arterial spray, and expirated spatter. So starting with impact spatter, this is a blood stain pattern that's produced when an object makes forceful contact with a source of blood. So this is um, impacting uh, an individual with uh, some weapon that draws blood or hitting a surface that has blood on it that makes it spatter everywhere. That's impact spatter. You're using some force to uh, spread the blood out. So there's going to be two types of spatter that we talk about, forward spatter and back spatter. So forward spatter is a uh, spatter that's going to travel in the same direction as the force. So if I had say blood on my hand and I went like this, any blood that flies forward is going to be forward spatter. If when I go like this, it spatters back towards me, that's back spatter. Blood that's going to travel towards the source of the force. So we can also classify impact spattered by there by the speed that it may have been traveling in. So we have low velocity. These are going to be more uh, large drops around four millimeters or more in diameter. And they're going to be produced by a force of up to five feet per second. Usually these are gonna be a result of gravity or minimal force or splashing from a blood pool. There's going to also be medium velocity so these are going to be smaller drops around one to four millimeters in diameter and they're produced by a force of five to 25 feet per second. Usually these are gonna be more associated with blunt force trauma. Unless we have high velocity, these are going to be very fine droplets, less than one millimeter in diameter. And they're gonna be produced by a force of hundred feet per second or faster. And these are usually gonna be associated with our gunshot wounds. Now, something important to uh, remember about classifying impact patterns this way is the velocity can give insight to the investigators on the general nature of a crime, but they're not going to tell us the specific events that produce this pattern pattern. So these are just like an estimate or guess as to what have may have occurred, but just classifying them in this way isn't going to give us these uh, specific events, and they're not going to be entirely accurate. A lot of other things can produce uh, patterns that are going to look like high velocity blood spatter, but they may not be high velocity blood spatter. So we have to keep these things, these things in mind while we're testifying and while we're doing these analyses. So we want to use these classifications cautiously and for descriptive purposes only. They're not conclusive. 
So this is an example of a low velocity spatter. It's just dripping due to the force of gravity. Uh, very big, a uh, lot bigger droplets. Uh, you can see if we have this pool, right? If they're falling into a pool, we're gonna have these satellite spatters uh, that make smaller stains as well. Medium velocity spatter. These are spatters that are associated with blunt force trauma. So as you can see, they're smaller in size, uh, still uh, generally pretty large uh, relative to the next uh, category. We're going to go into high velocity. Uh, but you can still see they're a lot smaller than the low velocity ones. Lastly, we have high velocity, again, associated with typically with gunshot wounds. So you have this fine spray of blood spatter all around, very small stains. And that brings us into gunshot spatter. So this is gonna be a subclass of impact spatter, typically characterized by that very fine spatter that is going to come from both the entry and exit wound. So remember we talked about forward and back spatter and this gives us a good example of that. So when the bullet is going to enter from say an individual, there's going to be, and it enters and exits, there's going to be forward spatter from the exit wound. Blood's going to come out from there. And blood is also gonna come back out through the entrance wound. That's going to be the back spatter. Now, if there's no exit wound, say the bullet doesn't perforate through the individual, it stays with inside them. Uh, we're not gonna see this forward spatter. All we're gonna have is back spatter. Moving on, we have cast off spatter. So this is a blood stain pattern that's created when blood is flung from a blood bearing object. So if this individual is attacking or assaulting someone with a bat and their bat gets blood on it while they're uh, committing this crime and they swing it up, blood that flings off of the bat, say onto the ceiling or onto a wall, that's cast off spatter. So this is typically um, seen as a linear string of stains that progress from circular to more elliptical in shape. And there's also going to be this increasing distance between the stains as we get further along in our cast off stain. So we're gonna start off with like when it's straight up, they're gonna be more 90 degrees. They're gonna be more circular in shape. And as we go back with it, it's going to get more elongated and the space between stains is also going to uh, increase. So the features of a cast off uh, pattern are affected by the size of the object, the amount of blood on the object and the direction the object is moving in. So remember we had those uh, the spines that we could see, these could also be present on our cast off spatter and we can tell which direction that our object was moving in by those spines. Uh, by counting the pairing of forward and backward patterns, so say they go like this and they bring it back down, so we may have one trail of cast off stains going this way, another one coming this way. We can try, we can use this to help us determine the minimum number of blows that were delivered by the perpetrator. Moving on to arterial spray spatter. This is a blood stain pattern caused by spurts that result from blood exiting under pressure from an arterial injury. So if an individual's neck was cut, we're going to see this arterial injury, this arterial spray. And it's going to, this blood is gonna be uh, typically brighter red in color because this, uh, the blood that's going to come out of this wound is going to be oxygenated. So it's going to look uh, a lot brighter red in comparison to these other types of impact spires and blood pools and blood stains that we're going to see. And the uh, main characteristic of arterial sprays, it's going to have this zigzag pattern. It's going to go up and down and up and down. And that's going to correspond with the heartbeat, the contraction and relaxation of the heart. So these ones, like these are kind of creepy, but also kind of interesting in that way where it corresponds with the individual's heartbeat. 
where it contracts and relaxes and it goes up and down like that in that zigzag pattern. And that's what's going to characterize an arterial spray. Lastly, we have expirated blood patterns. These are patterns caused by blood that is expelled out of the nose, mouth, or otherwise respiratory system. So if say the individual had a bloody nose and they blew their nose just into the air and it got onto the walls, we would have expirated blood patterns or say they're bleeding and they're coughing up blood, that's also expirated blood patterns. So these can lo sometimes look like high velocity impact stains. So we wanna keep this in mind again, when we're classifying these stains using velocity, that they could be mistaken for stains that maybe aren't from say a gunshot wound, but it could be expirated blood instead. The difference that um, would make it more uh, easily differentiated from a high velocity pattern is that expirated blood patterns can have a lighter color and this is due to the presence of saliva. So our saliva is then going to dilute our blood and it's going to give it a lighter color. There also may be oxygen bubbles trapped inside this uh, dried stain. So remember this is coming from our respiratory system, uh, things where we breathe in oxygen. So when we expel this blood, uh, when it's expirated, we may have oxygen bubbles trapped in it. And when it dries, we can see those oxygen bubbles and that's going to indicate that we have an expirated blood pattern. So that's what we have here. So we have see these uh, oxygen bubbles that are kind of dried into and incorporated into the stain. Moving on to our next category, we have transfer stains. So while impact pa uh, patterns can give us a lot of information regarding the, uh, the events that occurred, we can also get information from other types of stains uh, being transfer or passive stains. So we're gonna go over those two next. So transfer patterns are patterns that are created when a surface with blood comes into a con comes into contact with a second surface that is non-bloody. So there's three types of these transfer stains, wipe, swipe, and contact. So the first type of transfer stain we're gonna talk about is a wipe. This is a stain that's altered by an object moving through a pre-existing wet stain. And it's often characterized by a skeletonized stain. This is a, a ring with lighter marks around it, a darker ring with lighter marks around it. So this usually happens when the blood stain is already kind of drying. So the outside is going to dry faster than the inside of the stain, the interior of the stain. So when someone say, uh, say I had blood on my phone and it kind of dried a little, but then I tried to wipe it off, we might see this skeletonized stain here with me wiping through the middle of it. And that's going to give us this wipe. So remember, this is like someone wiping off blood, wiping off something off of a surface that has blood on it. So in this case, my hand would be the non-bloody surface and my phone would be the bloody surface. And this can give us information as to whether or not there was activity after the bloodletting event. Next, we have a swipe. So this is transfer of blood from a blood bearing surface to a non blood bearing surface and indicates relative motion between these two surfaces. So in this case, say I had blood on my hand and then wipe my phone, which doesn't have blood on it, that's going to be a swipe. So it's kind of the opposite of a wipe. Uh, and this is gonna be indicated by feathering. So feathering can help us determine the directionality that a swipe was made in. So feathering is when the stain gets lighter and it feathers as the pattern moves away from the initial contact point. So in this one, our initial contact point would be here. And as they move this way, the, uh, the stain is going to get less and less because they're gonna lose that blood as they wipe it across. So go ahead and pause your video again. 
try to determine if this is a swipe or wipe. Uh, so I'll let you pause and then when you're ready, you can unpause and we'll come back. So this is a wipe. Hopefully you pause and tried it out by yourself first, but this is a wipe. So we have these skeletonized stains here that we can see and that indicates that it's a wipe as opposed to a swipe. The last type of transfer stain that we're gonna talk about is a contact stain. So this is transfer from a blood-bearing surface to a non-blood-bearing surface uh, in which there is no motion. So we don't have any motion. So this is a bloody shoe print, a bloody fingerprint, uh, a bloody pattern that's made on a surface without moving. That's the important part in a contact stain. There's no movement involved. Lastly, we have passive blood stains. These are going to be blood stains that are created by the force of gravity. When we have three again, flow, pool, or uh, drop tails. And in these, we're gonna have a little more graphic pictures than the other ones. So keep that in mind as we go through these last few slides. So we have flows. So a flow is a blood stain pattern formed by the movement of smaller, large amounts of blood as a result of gravity. And this can help us determine the movement of an object or body after the blood had already started to flow. So in this picture here, we can see that the individual is bleeding and the blood is falling down like this. And it's consistent with gravity. Gravity would pull the blood down. Now say we found the body like this. This would in indicate to us that this body was probably moved after they had already started bleeding uh, because we can see that these blood drops and these blood flows are opposing gravity and defying gravity. So that would indicate to us that this body had been moved sometime after the individual had started bleeding and these blood drops had already started to dry. Moving on to pools. So a blood pool is when blood collects on a level surface and is undisturbed. So it forms when a source of blood is stationary for a long period of time. So this could be say when an individual is uh, bleeding out, they can't move and they're bleeding. So we get this large blood pool uh, under them. And something that can be helpful for us, but not, uh, definitive in any way is uh, we can use this and the state that the blood pool is in to try to determine and estimate the timing that or the time that an incident occurred. The reason why this isn't definitive is the rate at which these blood pools are going to dry is going to vary. Obviously, the volume and amount of blood is going to affect how fast that uh, our stain dries, but it can be helpful in just giving a very rough estimate, a guesstimate as to what time this bloodletting incident had occurred. Uh, last, and also about pools, if it's on an absorbent surface, it may appear larger than if it was on, say, a, a hard floor like this. Remember when we were talking about uh, the shape and the effect of the surface, when we have a rougher absorbent surface, the stain's going to be a little more irregular in shape. And I said that if we had something that's absorbative, say like carpet or fabric, the stain can appear larger than it actually is. And that's because when our blood is deposited onto those, it's going to absorb it and kind of spread out the blood stain. That's why on these types of surfaces, fabrics, carpets, our stains and pools could look a little bit larger than they would be on say a tile floor. The last type of pattern we're gonna talk about is a drop tail pattern. So this is a pattern of blood stains formed by the dripping of blood off of a moving surface or person in a recognizable pathway separate from other patterns. So this is often seen in stabbings. So if the individual has um, say a knife and they're, they just stab someone, they're walking away from the crime scene holding the knife they may have 
the knife is going to drop blood, uh, blood drops, and that's just going to be due to gravity, right? It's not going to be cast off or impact stains. It's just dripping off the knife due to gravity as the individual walks away. And this could be very helpful in crime scene reconstruction. It will show us movement or it could lead to the discarded weapon or if say the suspect was bleeding or the perpetrator was bleeding and they were say they cut their hand during the stabbing and their hand is bleeding and dripping blood. This would give us information on them if we run DNA on it. So the last type kind of is its own category. Uh, I did include it in the passive one. So it's gonna be a void pattern. This is the absence of blood stains and it's caused by the presence of an object blocking the blood at the time of the bloodletting event. So here we kind of have the outline of what looks like a person. So when this bloodletting event occurred, they were probably either sitting or lying down here when they were being attacked or if another individual was being attacked and someone was laying here, that would be uh, what would have a blood uh, a void pattern. We have something blocking the surface in which a blood is being deposited on. So this will give us information about the size, shape, and position of the items or the person during a bloodletting event the object that is blocking the blood from the surface. And it can help establish the position of the victim or assailant at the time of the incident. So say um, in this case, this is probably the victim and we can get information about their body position. They're probably lying down. This can also go the other way. Say uh, we had a, a, a shooting occur and the individual was shot. And when they shot them, the perpetrator was standing there and the back spatter kind of went on them and onto a wall behind them. Where their body was, it's going to block where that blood stain hit the wall and it's gonna be deposit on them instead. So when they leave, we're gonna have this void pattern on the wall of their body blocking that back spatter. All right, and with that, we are finished with bloodstain pattern analysis. In our next one, we're going to go into forensic biology and then get started on DNA. All right, I'll see you in the next one.